thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a few questions for you. Starting at the beginning, research on you is a little uh, sparse here in the archives. Why is that? I really don't know what, what happened and how that happened. In the beginning, it was just a fundraising thing, and then we started getting involved with L.A. and M. So I think there was like a gap in between there. Okay. Okay. So starting again at, at right at the start, right at the beginning, where did you grow up? Uh, I was raised in Tampa, Florida, my parents are Cuban, and then we moved uh, to uh, New York City, the Bronx. Okay. Why did your family go there? Uh, my father is a cigar, his family is a cigar maker, and Havana Cuba Cigar, for those who smoke cigars, and uh, so they started up their own business in uh, the Bronx. How did you spend your time in the Bronx? Uh, we all went to Catholic schools, so we're all the good girls. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> um, and after school, we used to come home and help my dad put the cellophane on the cigar box, and the, each cigar they put it in the box. We did that, uh, which we actually enjoyed doing that. And um, half of my family lived in the same building as we did. So. So did you go outside a lot, or did you spend most of your time inside? Inside, because those days you know, my parents wouldn't let us play outside, so I don't know how to ride a bicycle, I can't roll a skate. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we stayed in the house a lot. So what was it like to have to watch the other children outside while you were inside? It was a pity party for us. Yeah. But we did coloring, and uh, my grandmother lived with us, so we played games. What sort of games did you play with her? I don't remember, it was like <laughs> years ago. <laughs> I was a little bitty. <laughs> So tell us about Catholic school a little bit. What was it like for you? Uh, it was hard because my sister was like the brain in the family, so and I was the in-between sister, so I was not too bright. So every time I couldn't solve a problem, they called my older sister to come in, and then I get a smack in the face and end up paddling my knuckles. <laughs> so it, it wasn't very good. Once I graduated, I never went back to church, school, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> City's Greenwich Village at one time. Yes, I did. Tell us a little bit about that and the time frame that was involved with that. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I kept on telling everybody, oh, I'm going to go to Greenwich, Greenwich Village. The Bohemians were there. Everybody was so free and wonderful. And so I, my first job, I saved money and moved there. And uh, I live on uh, one St. Mark's place where all the Bohemians were. They used to play cards and play their games outside. <laughs> And then throughout the years, of course, it all changed, but it was wonderful living there. So did you encounter a lot of the gay scene there at the time? Oh, God, yes. Tell us a bit about that. Um, I used to be able, like, my building, half the men were gay, so it was, like, very comfort zone for me. Um, so we used to go to the gay bars, well, not all, but some of the gay bars, and we used to have home, home parties. Everybody used to cook and, and have a good time doing that, so I definitely enjoyed that. So what were the bars like at that time? You know something, uh, I don't remember it that well because we, it's, if I wish I, I would have experienced more of it because we never did go back to the New York Eagle. It was just more like the neighborhood. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so I really don't, don't know the difference. Were there, are there any people that you specifically remember from your time there? No. Oh, too bad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm old, honey. <laughs> <laughs> what took you to California? I met this, at the time, wonderful man and, uh, in, in Greenwich Village, and um, he swept me off my feet, and he said, let's go, let's save money and go to California. And I said, okay, I'll try that, see what happens, and uh, then we got married, had children, got a divorce, um, which was, it was, it was good, it was no, no drama there, thank God. <laughs> but I have two beautiful children, uh, Robin is uh, 40, She'll be 41 in October, and my son William will be uh, 38 in. Uh, oh, he was 38, yeah, in May. And then I have a granddaughter who's just turned 15. So, how do they react to you and your involvement in the leather community and the gay community? 
all my son was like, oh, that kind of thing. And then after he started meeting the boys that came to my house, I thought, oh, mom, they have like fun. I go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he used to come and play cards with my boys and we all cocktails. So yeah, it wasn't that much of a problem. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, in interviewing some of your family members in preparation, I was told that you have helped raise the town of Dublin, California. How have you done that? After I had my second child, I didn't want to go to work because I had a daycare for my daughter, and it was like I wasn't happy with her, and I have two of them. So then I got pregnant with my son, and, <clears throat> and I decided I'm going to stay home. And, uh, and when he was about six months old, we needed extra money, so I said, I was not doing daycare. So I started putting ads in and got my license. So I raised half of Dublin, and plus did children I've taken care of. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. Have you ever had any issues with uh, any of the parents from the children? No, but this is a funny story. Um, when I meet a parent, it's, even if it's 150 degrees, I have to turn leg, you know, and change the color and help out. I do the whole nine yard and. Um, and then during the day when the, when the parent leave, I just like, you know, tank top on, whatever. And it was gay pride, and I was in pride. And I had like a brother, sister, seven and eight years old. They knew exactly where my tattoos were. And so it was on a Sunday, and the gay pride, and I was there having a good old gay time. Monday morning, the mother and the, the kids come in, and he goes, oh, Nana, you know, the kids said that you were on TV with the gay people. <laughs> And I would go, oh, no, not me. And they go, oh, yeah, they said you have this, you know, AIDS ribbon over here, and you got the eagle over there. And I said, yeah, that was me. And she go, oh, that's hella cool. So that broke the ice. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, new parents that came to visit and interview me, take me as I am. Black man's tattoo, that's me. So I never had a problem with it. Wonderful. Well, you alluded a little bit ago to your children and your granddaughter. Let's. I permanently straight. I'm still straight. <laughs> <laughs> and there were apparently a couple of people with whom you used to go out, Nancy and Stacy. Oh God, yes. Tell us a bit about that. <laughs> okay, so you know, Stacy and I, we lived like the, uh, we've known each other forever. We both have two kids, two kids, and she worked in San Francisco, and we both got a divorce within a few months of each other, and so we decided girls' night out Thursday. So, and her kids, our kids were like. 15, I'm acting 12 and 13. So we had to leave them home in the evening for a few hours. So we used to go to the straight floor by her house, and the guys, you know, you walk in, they want to buy a cocktail, and you can tell them the number, we were not into that. So I said, Nancy, uh, Stacy, let's go to the gay bars in San Francisco. So she spoke to Nancy, who knew San Francisco. So one Saturday, we all went up there, and we went to, um, on Castro, and it was like, yes, such a good time. Except that Nancy, had, for, for us to stay with her on the weekends, we had to stay, we had to go to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Which was not a good thing. <laughs> so we did that for about four months, and um, and one time we were there at church, and the, and the priest came, got up on the stage or whatever, and he said, all of a sudden he blared out, if you're gay, it's not a good thing because Jesus said, and, and I go, oh my God. I just got up. I said, well, oh, I said. <laughs> <laughs> and so I walked out. Nancy, uh, Stacy and I walked out, and Nancy was really upset because she was like into the Jesus and, and, and all that kind of And she didn't like hanging out with the gay guys, but I did. And um, so we. Uh, Stacy and I kept on going, and uh, then we stopped going because I like going every weekend. We she didn't want to go every weekend, so. But that's how I met a lot of the boys at that time. Tell us a bit about that. Uh, what were your impressions of the gay scene at that time? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. How? It, it was the guys were were really nice. Um, I know I, I felt safe being around so many men. And I knew there was a friendship there that I didn't have to worry about being molested or being disrespected like you do in, in straight bars. And so um, it just kept on growing and growing. Are there any people in particular you remember from that time? 
Yes, the first person that I met, Ernestine. <laughs> That's how I got my name, Mama. We walked into the Phoenix on Castro's a dance bar.
they picked up more, and when they came to my turn, they said, oh, yes, you know, $50 for mom. I said, oh. And then they picked what they're going to wear. I don't look pretty in purple <laughs> and lavender. And, and, and I was like, no, I can't do it. So the next person raises, you know, it's like the, the money kept on piling up. So they made me wear, after they said three thousand dollars, how could I say no? So three thousand dollars, they put this short little lavender dress on me, not pretty, white stockings, heels like this, so I was walking lopsided, <laughs> my hair in ponytails, purple lipstick, purple eyeshadow, which I had on my eyes for like three days, couldn't get it out. And of course, <laughs> not pretty, and of course all the glitter. So what they do there, they, they, somebody in the, in the back room, they dress you up, and then all of a sudden they play a song, and then they push you through the curtain so you, you don't know what song is coming up. My song, thank God, was She Works Hard for the Money. <laughs> and then people tip me, so it was over $3,000, so it was for a good cause. One time only, I will never do it again. <laughs> Jeff Willoughby, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about some of the, the first people that were part of Mama's family. The first core group, there was Ernestine, but who else joined you in that first Oh, and there was so many. Jeffy, most of them were just gone. Oh. There were so many that were gone. I mean, they would, would get sick, and uh, and I'd be the one to go and take, you know, help take care of them. And the worst one was Teddy, that I kept on calling him. And you know how you know somebody's telephone number by heart. And I was calling him, he wouldn't reply, he wouldn't call. So one day I finally, like after two months, I said, you know, give me a call, you bitch. And I, and I left my telephone number. His ex-partner was there. The phone rang immediately and said, Mama, he's very sick. And now you know how sick he was. So they had a nurse there all the time, so I went to visit him. And when I walked into that house, I felt dead. And the nurse was cleaning him up and all that, so like, I couldn't go upstairs. And they were trying to feed him, he wouldn't eat. And so I went up there, he didn't know what was coming. And, um, and they said, Teddy, guess who's here? He goes, my mama. So I fed him, nobody could feed him, but I fed Teddy. And the next morning the phone rang, and I, Teddy was gone. So it was like, you know, bad memories in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Were these, was the family uh, focused mostly on any particular bar, any particular place in San Francisco? You know, not really, because we did Polk Street there for a while, too. Mm -hmm. We went to all the boss on Polk Street, and of course I met more of the guys there, and uh, more, more direct shows that were going on on Polk Street. So, uh, and then of course, um, Castro, but then I saw how I got involved with the leather was I saw this gorgeous, hunky man in leather walking in front of Daddy's bar in Castro, and I go, oh my God, look at that guy. Where did leather guys go? He go, you don't want to go there, Mama. I said, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so needless to say, the next weekend I came out, they took me to some shop, and I got a little vest, and I got a little pair of boots, you know, the beginning thing, and um, and started going to the Eagle and the Powerhouse, and the rest is history. So, what were some of your impressions of that? Anything that surprised you, shocked you? Mm -mm. <laughs> you know, it's funny because certain bars, I know my where not to go, like the back rooms, no upstairs, <laughs> so it's funny because a lot of the women wouldn't be even allowed in some of the bars because some of the women were go into the men's space, I don't know what you guys call it, but intrude, you know, by the pool table where they're doing naughties, I don't go there. <laughs> so, but it, like the, the bar could be packed, especially like um, the Level B gets the stuff packed with other towners, and a few times that somebody is there, oh, there's a woman in here. Oh, it's only mama. <laughs> <laughs> so they, 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 they didn't mind, they accepted it, and they know my limits, I don't, you know, snoop around. Wonderful. Well, I understand that over the years as the family has evolved, several awards have come up. So tell us about the Drama Queen Award. Oh my God. I understand you won it. Yes. 
<laughs> it's when a person is complaining all the time, they think it's all about them, that everybody's out to get them. They get the drama queen pen and they have to go for a month. <laughs> and then we have the mama's bitter, uh, the mama's bitter one that they ate the whole freaking world. And they have the rest. Of it. They've been behaving so they always had it for a long time. Why did you win the drama queen award? Oh God, it was my jaw was slow and the bills had to get paid and I was having like too many cocktails and my mouth went up. <laughs> they gave me the pen. <laughs> but it was a fun thing. I did wear it for a month. <laughs> The family continues to grow. What thoughts have you about the family growing so large? Did you ever foresee this? No, no. Yeah, this is like a, a fairy tale book. I mean, I look at my family and I think about them, and it's like the most inspiration that I've had in my life. Wow. And they make me feel so good. I love you guys so much. And they know that I always tell them, they always say, I love you, Mama, but I'm the top of the family, so I always say, I love you more. <laughs> you know, because they, I mean, I could never live without all of you guys that have been touched in my heart. So, how many people are in the family now? Way too many. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, like a thousand forty something. Oh my gosh. And I'll be giving birth today, so you guys who have never seen that, I would be giving birth to a couple of people here tonight. Does having so many people in the family become overwhelming? Yeah, when I look at the list of number one to, uh, to 1,043, it's like, and all the names are different, it's like, why does this ever happen? I ask myself, you know, what have I done to deserve you? It's, it's such a beautiful feeling. And if I died tomorrow, I would have died a happy person. How many international locations are represented? Uh, we have in Canada, we have over 50 in Canada. Um, in Washington, oh, in Chicago, we have so many. They <laughs> 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 come out of the woodwork. <laughs> yeah, but in Canada, we have over 50 mama's family there. Any, any in other locations, further locations? Uh, one in, for two in France, and, um, and of course, every state's got one of you. So, oh, and one German daddy. Mm. <laughs> I think the audience liked that one. Yeah, <laughs> he's a hottie, too. <laughs> we can only help. <laughs> Incest is not best. <laughs> so, in, in your fundraising efforts in any given year, generally, how much money do you generate for your charities? You know, it's. When we, when we first got it, I didn't keep track of it, and then somebody said, oh, keep track of how much money San Francisco family <coughs> raises, and we bring over a, a million. And then, yes. <laughs> and then with like Chicago family and every state that started raising money, I kept track of it for a while, but it was overwhelming. So I think we raised over three million a year. Um, and whatever Chicago raises, it, it stays here. People thought in the beginning that you do a fundraiser in their town and they send me the money now. You do it in your town, it stays in your town. I, in talking with some of your family members, I'm told that you are a, con a convener. You are able to bring people together for charitable work. How do you see yourself in that capacity? I don't know. I, I think it's something that just happened. I think people who were waiting for somebody to direct them, to inspire them. And at least I hope so, because it, it proves it every time. I, you know, I see the Pantheon winners, and 99% of the Pantheon list is my family. Yeah, it's, it's overwhelming. I'm sorry, I have to cross that. <laughs> so, I'm also told that you cross all the lines of the how do you accomplish that? What do you mean by that? Well, I'm just told that there's no such thing as mama being uh, not part of a certain group of people or unable oh, to yeah. access a certain group of people. 
It just happened. You know, amazing people, people in the community seem to like me. The transgender, I have family members that are transgender. I mean, I don't have a problem with anybody because I treat everybody with manners and respect. Do you see that continuing in the community? I hope so. Because at times I'm very disappointed with the community at large. How are you disappointed? The lack of manners and respect. The, the, the lack of, 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 of or the, the backstabbing. We were talking to some of my boys last night. Uh, the backstabbing that goes on. Um, and, and I was trying to explain to them my feelings about that when somebody, especially the type of older group or place so that they start to yeah, attack somebody and they keep on. And then instead of people not responding, somebody has to respond. So that person builds himself up to respond back. And it goes on for days. And I, you know, I read the first couple of times, and after that, it's delete, delete, delete. And these people, if you stop and think about it, these are the people that have never been to your fundraiser, never donated one dollar to your cause, and you don't see them. They never do anything. But they're the first one to bitch about about somebody else who is busting your butts doing something for the community. And that's my, my personal feelings. Well, do you feel that being a woman in the leather community, a matriarch, if you will, do you think that that enables you to better draw people together to motivate people? Oh, well, I think so. How do you see that? Um, Every time I travel and I come back home, I, my email is, it, I swear to God, this is the honest to goodness truth. People are afraid to approach me. Why, I do not know, but when I come back from IML, MAL, fall, wherever I go, I get email, oh man, I'm the way to talk to you, but we really know how to approach you, how to become part of the family, give me your family, and they want information, so I direct them to my, my website, everything is, is there. And so they're like, we we'll become friends online. And then when they want to become part of the family, send me a bio. Tell me what you've done for your community. I don't pay you because you are cute. You got nice tits, big down there. I don't care what you got or don't got. Work for your community and you're part of my family. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself a community icon? No, no I don't. Why not? Because I'm just a little old me, yeah. and my life has been built, and it's, it, it's nice, but I consider myself average like everybody else. Incredible. Because a lot of people would say that you're probably one of the bigger names in it. I know, and thank you, but I, I'm a little old me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your leather walks. Why did those begin? How did they begin? Okay, we can't, we, it started, I forgot what year. I was just involved with raising money and walking. And eight years ago, the guy who used to coordinate everything passed with AIDS. But before he passed away, I went to his other shop because he used to do alterations and things there. And he was very, he didn't look very healthy. And I knew he wasn't doing well. So he said, I'm going back home to my, my folks. They're going to take care of me. I said, oh. And if, I don't know why, but the first thing out of my mouth was, who's going to do leather walk? And he, and, and he goes, Mama, of course you. And I've never produced anything that big because it is kind of big. And so I said, really? He goes, yeah. You've got the people behind you. You can do it. You know what to do. And so I did my little fast research and, and started this year being nine years. And what it is, you have a plus sheet and you get people to donate whatever you, they want and um, for, for the leather walk. In the beginning, before I got involved, I used to be for AIDS, for the AIDS Emergency Fund. And then when I got involved, and I knew women who had, uh, went through breast cancer, and I spoke to the founder of, which is Art Tomaszewski, I said, Art, oh, can I do half and half? He said, by all means. So that year, we raised $32,000. We had tons of women, bikers, everybody came out for that. So I really enjoyed doing that. So tell me. I learned um, that there's a particular woman that you would visit in some of the projects in somewhere around San Francisco, and this is building into your toy drive. Brenda's house.
Tell me about oh, visiting God. Brenda's house. I wish I could lose weight by just shedding tears. <laughs>
displeases you. When they're mean and, and rude and nasty. <laughs> but I don't know, too, you know, I'm fourth, I don't know too many people like that, so. Great. Okay. You're burning through a lot of my questions very quickly. Uh -oh. I had prepared about four, <laughs> pretty quick on them. <laughs> Have your tattoos any special meaning? Yes, this one especially, that's the last one I got, it says family. And I was, uh, I think it was South Leather Fest or someplace like that about four years ago. And uh, I don't know if you guys know Jenna, she's a tattoo artist. And uh, I was introduced, she was going to do tattoos that weekend. And um, I was introduced to her. And she said, Mama, I know, I, I know about you and your family. And I've been wanting to get like a symbol of a family, something or other. And she said, I, and she doesn't know me. And she goes, I have this vision of having like a tattoo for you with, with a family thing on it. I said, bless your heart, that's what exactly what I wanted. And so she said, I'll have something for you. They were having a, a breakfast in the morning. She says, I'm going to sketch out something for you, and, and you let me know. Well, she did this. And when I saw it, I just, I sat there, and I did my crime thing. <laughs> and um, it didn't even hurt, because I loved it so much. And it didn't even, I don't, I don't remember her putting that needle to my arm. All the rest I remember, this one was like the most beautiful tattoo ever. So that's because of my traveling. Great. Well, in part of my research, I learned that you've always wanted to be a biker. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> well, the I'm too old now. <laughs> <laughs> when I can die and come back, I will be. Well, what, what, what's your desire there? What prompts that desire? You know something? I always liked leather. And I remember being around 12 years old, and I told my parents, they said, you know, what do you want for Christmas? I said, I want a leather jacket. And they said, no, because people are going to think you're a tramp. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 12 years old. Hello. <laughs> and, and, um, and I said, oh, please. And then my cousin, Freddie, he was like two years older. He got the leather jacket. So what we used to do, we used to all go to school together, me and my regular jacket, him and his, his leather jacket. And we used to, he used to get, let me walk, wear his leather jacket to school and take it off and give it back to him. And it was like such a joy, but I always loved leather. Um, so that's it. <laughs> well, I'm also told that you speak fluent Spanish, so you've overheard a few conversations during IML with some of the hotel staff. Tell us a bit about that. It was so rude, and I was not drinking then, I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> I was not. So, I am now around four or five years ago, my boys and I walk into our room, just getting in, tired, and the housekeeping, they were calling, amen, very bad words because they were leaving naughty things in the room for them to pick up. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And so we went and, up, and, we, and unpacked and we came back down, they were still talking and they, was, they kept on getting, I guess after each room they went to, it got worse and worse for them. <laughs> <laughs> so the conversation was in Spanish and I understand Spanish. And so I finally had to, so anyhow, so the boys said, don't say anything, mom. So we went down, we had brunch or something. I had my little cocktail, we came up there still talking. <laughs> And so I said in Spanish, I says, you know, pardon me, I said, not every gay man is that dirty. I've been listening to your conversation, you know, earlier today, and it's a, oh, put no, I'm sorry. I said, no, don't be sorry. I said, if you don't want to pick up naughty things from the room, tell the manager. It's not your job to pick up, and they were saying, anyhow, you guys are talking, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I said, it's not your job to pick up this nasty thing. I said, these are pigs. These are not, I said, not all other men are like that. Not every gay person is nasty like this. And so she apologized and, you know, and I don't know what happened after that, but I didn't hear any more talking after that. <laughs> were they very surprised? They were shut. They all looked at me like, oh my God. <laughs> 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 they did. They were totally shocked. And our boys were like, going in a room, put the key in this. <laughs> So in building on that a little bit, what preconceived notions have people had about you? 
what does that mean? Ideas that they've had before they've met you, opinions they've formed without knowing you. I think a, a few, and they still do. They think they're afraid to approach me. They think that maybe I, I'm not. I don't know. I think I don't know. Okay. What are your favorite items of leather? My corset. Sorry, I'm not wearing it tonight. <laughs> what about it do you like? Um, I like when I'm cinched in it. <laughs> So it, it feels you, so good. <laughs> it just, you know, everything goes in its right place. <laughs> <laughs> and I look thinner. <laughs> my clothes get bigger. <laughs> I love wearing, wearing my corset. Do you only have one? No, I have way too many. How many? I have like eight of them. Okay. And I'll tell you a little story about my corset because yes. some of you have seen me wear the black one with the red trimming thing on it. So we went to Guerneville. And we came back and I parked my car at my, one of my boys' house and get up in the morning to get in my car that got busted my, the window out of my car. They stole my, my suitcase with two of my courses, three of my floggers, and all my little things that I wear. Handcuffs, everything was gone. So I'm like totally panicked. So I called my friends and guess what happened to me? I'm like, so one of my family members, her name is, she's a drag queen. Uh, he's Steve Crawford, but his, uh, his uh, drag name is Snatch, so he's Mama Snatch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, I told him the story. He goes, "Oh my God, it's probably you know that in, in um, uh, I forgot that area they call there with all the hippies and stuff. I forgot what they call it now. Yeah, uh -huh, exactly. And he actually went there. He says, Mama." When I walked in that store where I thought I was going to find it, the first store, he said, I looked up and they had your red corset up there for $30. <laughs> they had all my stuff up on the wall. So she said, she told the manager, that's mama, that's mama, give it to me right now and we call the cops. <laughs> and got all my stuff except my handcuffs, which those are cheap. But my floggers, that uh, one of my daddies gave me a really beautiful one. That was way up there for like twenty dollars. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> but I got my stuff back. That's great. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Absolutely. So, tell us about the Mama's Barbie doll that you received. Well, we told you that. <laughs> A little oh late. my God! Oh my God! <laughs> well, there's got to be a good story there. Oh, You've got that right. Yeah. <laughs> so. I used to have barbecues at my house, Fourth of July barbecues. And you invite three people, and you expect maybe eight or nine. So every year it kept on getting bigger and bigger. So we used to do tequila shots out of out of the bottle. And pack when we we were drinking regular stuff and we got more messed up we started drinking tequila. So one of the boys one year for my birthday, he gave me a, a Barbie doll, hair almost like this. A mask, because I love wearing masks, a mask. The nipples were pierced like mine with a chain <laughs> through it. Boots up to here like I have. Tight pants, and it, I looked at this thing and I go, oh my god, I wish I was looking that good. <laughs> so what they would, what they did was they bought the doll that, that 4th of July and they had a bottle of tequila. They strapped her legs around here and everybody had to do mama. <laughs> Every year, Fourth of July, Mama came out, sat on the ball, and they all got <laughs> Well, it, it allude, you alluded to masks. Tell us a bit about masks. What is it, what appeals to you there? Um, I have several, but actually, I donated it. Oh, not donated. I put it inside an auction and got money for that because they're like, I'm getting older. It's hard getting to confront with all this extra uh, stuff, but. Um, I've gotten good money when I set it up for a Southern auction, but I love masks and I had, um, his name is um, Th uh, Toro uh, in San Francisco and one day he looked at me, I didn't know who he was, and he says, ma'am, come here, and I'm like, me? He goes, yeah. He goes, I make leather masks and I want to make you one. So I said, really? And all I could think was like a hood type thing, which that's not good for me. <laughs> but, 
And I said, really? He goes, yeah. He said, here's my card, call me up, and, and come and, and I'll make a mask. He does it for your face, individually. So I went there, of course I took two of my boys with me, and um, he did the most beautiful mask. Um, it's hard to describe, but one had horns. I love things with horns. And one of them is like a full face mask with big ears and horn. It's absolutely to die for. So the first year, I think it was Dory or Paul, so I put that on, and everybody's like, oh my god. You know, and he gave it, he actually gave it to me, sold it to me for like a hundred bucks, which I was going, this is kind of cheap. And what he wanted me to do eventually, which is what happened, I guess he was hoping, because I knew people that have the word of mouth, and he usually charges like six hundred dollars for his mask. And they're, they're, whoever wears, if any of you have ever worn a mask, you know how sweaty it gets? His does not get that way. So I wore it false and everybody went crazy over it. So then I got uh, him to vend at Folsom. One is it, put a table out right there, you know, pay your vending fee or whatever. I gave him all the information. His mask all went like that. So then he, for thanking me for all the money that he made, he made me three other ones. And I think on that slide that you had earlier, there's one or two that I wore before that I liked from him. Cool. Well, you burned through most of my questions. I've only got one left. I had 42 questions for you. But in wrapping up my formal part of the interview, what will be your legacy? My family. Oh. Some people have some questions for one of them. Since we've got her, you may as well get her here. Yeah, I think I have uh, time to burn, get burned. Sure, I can do all that. Absolutely. And get your credit cards out. I'm going to be asking for money. Yeah. <laughs> for Elliot and not for me. Cool. Okay, let's let's show a little bit of video. And um, what I'm going to do really quickly, I'm just going to slide the chair over here so it's out of the way. Three 